Nintendo 64 may not have been Nintendo's most successful console, but it holds a special place in a lot of our hearts with some really interesting genre-defining games. But unfortunately these days, it's not the easiest system to play. With limited video output options, we're left to third-party companies to create new and interesting ideas and projects that can serve our needs. One such project is the Eon and 64 HDMI adapter, which we're going to be talking about today, along with some other potential video options for the system. And to do that, I am joined by my good friend, Mark, from My Life in Gaming. Welcome to DF Retro. Always good to be here and, you know, to talk about the N64, which is one of my favorite topics. Absolutely. And, you know, just like we did last year, we're reconvening, putting our minds together to discuss another Nintendo HDMI solution. So, uh, first off, the N64 is a little bit complex from a video standpoint in the sense that, I mean, you know this, of course, uh, it doesn't support things like RGB video natively. It's like S-Video is the top end option that you can get by default in an unmodified 64. And um, so the actual best options for video quality are stuff like the Ultra HDMI and Tim Worthington's N64 RGB. These are, these are the supreme options, but they're really quite expensive. Uh, they're not that much more than some of the other options, but the main thing is they require your system to be modified. Now I have the N64 RGB. I know you have the Ultra HDMI. Uh, I mean, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, I will say that the Ultra HDMI has for many years been my personal favorite console mod of, of all console mods. It mostly because it innovated the idea of de-blurring the N64 image with, with original hardware. Um, and it does that by sort of applying this uh, algorithm to games that are 320 pixels wide, which is a majority of the library. Uh, and it just makes the pixels look razor sharp, uh, which is kind of, the N64 video output is very soft and, and some people prefer softer output, but I really like in most cases uh, what you can get with that de-blur option. And at the time that came out, you could not do a similar thing with analog video, but I know you've got the Tim Worthington RGB board, which is kind of a more expensive, more complex RGB mod uh, compared to what, what I term the old style N64 RGB mod, which just uses like a basic RGB amp, uh, is a lot less expensive, but can only be installed in early N64 consoles. And I believe uh, no PAL consoles work with that style of mod. So Tim Worthington from Australia, uh, who also made the, the very excellent NES RGB mod, uh, does have this RGB board they can be installed in any N64. And after the Ultra HDMI was released, uh, a de-blur option was added to that. So fans of analog video can use that with RGB. Yep, that's exactly right. And that's the solution that I primarily use. So whenever I featured N64 games and videos, like the recent Turok episode, all captured with uh, the N64 RGB. You, but you know, as I said, the main issue with these is that fundamentally they need to be installed in a console. You have to modify your system and not everybody wants that solution. So I thought it was interesting to take a look at uh, this new Eon thing, which is basically a plug and play product instead of an actual mod. So, but there's another option as well, which we'll discuss that you have as, uh, a bit later. And now I personally have not used the Eon, so I'm, I'm interested to hear your impressions of it. Yeah, so I guess the main thing to start with, it does come in this cool little box, I suppose, and you can tell, you know, the, the packaging and the build quality, it's, it's a, it seems solid. They really thought about plugging it into an N64 system and that it fills the port completely, and it has this little foot here that rests on the flat surface to prevent it from straining the port on your N64. So I do appreciate that option. On the other hand, the venerable Lord Voltar posted a teardown of the Super 64 itself, and you can kind of see that 
the connectors inside don't quite have that kind of quality you might expect. Mm -hmm. uh, and also I know that Joe from GameSack looked at this thing as well, and on his, uh, one of the audio channels wasn't even connected, which was a little bit weird. Mm -hmm. Uh, but obviously, being that this is designed to work with stock N64 systems, it is pulling S-Video from the AV out on the system. Uh, and that's what was really interesting to me, because I, you know, S-Video can look pretty good, but you're all, it's still a limited analog video option that's being converted to digital using this adapter. Yeah, it's only S-Video, which uh, on the surface, that's kind of a hard pill to swallow thinking about you know, you're, you're paying this big price for a device that is only capable of upscaling S video, which is, you know, certainly not the most premium signal. And it's interesting though, to me, because in my opinion, as long as you're not using D blur, the jump from composite to S video to RGB, you know, the RGB mods might actually be the smallest jumps uh, with N64 compared to any other system uh, because N64 composite in, in my opinion is actually not that bad as far as composite goes. It can be difficult sometimes to show a clear comparison between composite and S video that really shows the upgrade of S video because it doesn't have as strong of like rainbow artifacts and stuff that a lot of other systems have with composite video. So uh, S video is, uh, you know, it's, it, it's it, it, but it is clean on the N64. Um, but the N64 kind of has this ceiling of video quality in a sense, uh, just because it's so blurry to begin with. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And that's kind of one of just, it's just a limitation that you have to contend with. The D blur function on certain mods definitely helps as we suggested. That's not an option here, though they do have their own thing. But um, I will say that the end result is surprisingly clean. Uh, on 240p games, there isn't a lot of image noise. There's just a touch of it. But I do feel like there is also the N64. What do you, See if you know what I'm talking about here. On a lot of N64 games, there's like this weird, almost film grain-like effect going on. It has nothing to do with the video signal. It's something being generated by the system's graphics processor it's very strange though and it's very specific to the n64 hardware yeah um i forget if it's chameleon twist one or chameleon twist two but at least one of those games i remember has this really we like it's it's more distinct than most games uh the, the, this really grainy appearance uh that you can sort of see especially in like dark colors uh but yeah uh i i don't know what the purpose of that was because it's for the most part, kind of difficult to see on a CRT TV, um, but but yeah, that, but that you're right. That is, it's almost like dithering is kind of this artifact that people can see when the video quality is like a, a higher output, and they're like, wow, well, ah, what is what what are these patterns I'm seeing? The N64 can kind of have a, a similar thing with some of that those sort of grainy looking games. And it's just an inherent part of how that game was programmed. Yeah, exactly, and there's nothing that can be done about that. And so like you say, there is this kind of ceiling uh, with N64 video quality where RGB is nice, but it's not a massive leap over S-Video, which in itself is a nice but not huge leap over composite in this case. That's just N64 video, uh, that's just how it goes. Um, so, you know, I guess obviously with this thing, the need to make it compatible with all systems results in the limit to S video, but the end result is pretty good. And I was surprised at how nice it looks blown up on a large screen. So obviously this kind of depends on how well your display can handle 480p. Uh, the LG OLEDs do actually do a relatively nice job, I think, with reasonably sharp, clean pixels. It's not a huge blurry mess, uh, but some of them don't handle it that well. And one of the issues is that you, could, you have that HDMI output. You can use another scaler to scale 480p up to like say 1080p, but the traditional ones like the FrameMeister don't actually work with it, mm. uh, with its HDMI input. Obviously the OSSC isn't designed to do this with HDMI. Uh, some receivers will do it, but it adds input latency. So you really kind of need to make sure that your display can handle 480p well for this to look good. Yeah, and I, I think 480p is, at least in my experience, seems like a relatively high priority for uh, 
televisions to upscale well. Um, you know, if you're if you're inputting just the native 240p signal into the TV, which is probably very difficult to do for most people on a modern TV because composite and S video are just becoming very uncommon. But even if actually that that that's a good point there, real quick, and that's one of the reasons why products like this even exist. I think is getting composite S video or even component or anything on a modern TV is is not easy and most of them don't handle 240p properly anyway. So it's one of those things where if you just hook up your N64 just with old composite cables, it's generally gonna look really, really bad, if it works at all. And in most cases, you're going to have that TV misinterpret 240p as 480i, and so you're going to get input lag uh, just from it trying to do this deinterlacing process that it doesn't need to do on a 240p signal. So 480p, you're sending a progressive signal to your TV, and in theory, in most cases, that's going to result in significantly less input lag than uh, a misinterpreted 240p signal. Correct, and yeah, obviously, this outputting 240p, internally, this device uh, line doubles the image. That's all it's doing, it's not actually scaling anything, it's just line doubling from 240p to 480p and producing the end result, as you see. Um, right, and that, and that basic line doubling uh, kind of ensures that it is lag-free and- Exactly. Uh, and uh, if uh, anyone saw uh, some of the tests that Bob from RetroRGB did, uh, he did confirm that this device is lag-free. And that's good. And uh, I will say, though, that I do wish that when developing products like this, they could have tried to go maybe the extra step to get, say, like Line 4X mode, like we see on the OSSC. I think that would make a huge difference in terms of overall clarity for many, many users. But again, there is that limitation there. there but there is another feature that I want to talk about real quick, and it's this... The smoothing option. Um, yeah, I think they call it the slick mode. <laughs> yeah, oh, they call it slick mode, which is okay. <laughs> um, so that's there's a little button on the side here. You click that, you enable slick mode, and it's some sort of interpolation option that is more effective than I would have expected. I, I don't. I typically hate this type of thing. It's terrible for 2D pixel art, but for the the style of 3D that we have on N64 here. And I actually have it enabled behind me, uh, running Goldeneye here. Uh, it it kind of works. It almost gives it almost gives the impression that the rendering resolution is increased a bit. So it's not sharp, but it does clean up edges in a in a fun way. And it, it, in that sense, it's actually depending on the game, it can actually work really well. And it's you know, so it's it's something to play with. I think. Yeah, and that that actually, that feature, I, I don't, you know, since I haven't seen it in person, I can't really say for myself how it compares, but there, it reminds me of a uh, similar feature on, I've got the RetroTink 2X, which is kind of like, uh, it's like a mini OSSC almost. And this, this, is the, uh, this is the other thing I wanted to talk about actually, because you have the RetroTink, I'm using this here. Um, the RetroTink is kind of the other option for N64 users in this case that want to do the same thing without having to rely on internal mods. So it's, yeah, like you say, it's like a mini OSSC design for S-Video and composite video. And component video. And component, that's right. So tell me, tell me about your experiences with this. Well, the, the RetroTink has, you know, been for about a year now, like kind of the lowest cost Upscaler, I don't think upscaler is really a technical word for what it does, because it, it, it does do line doubling, that 480p output in a very similar way to uh, what the, the Eon device is doing. Uh, except, uh, obviously you can connect, you know, uh, component, as video composite uh, into this device, so you can use it with a wide array of systems, and especially for N64 fans, this has been my go-to recommendation. It's the lowest cost, device of its type that I really feel comfortable recommending. It is just over a hundred dollars. Um, but and what does that get you with, with that? Well, you get you 480p output and you have the option to apply a smoothing filter that, uh, from what I've seen is relatively similar. Uh, I can't recall if I ever tested it with N64 
but I did test it uh, a lot with uh, original PlayStation, which were everything is, uh, the image is so much sharper on PlayStation. The pixel edges are smooth. The texturing is, is, is sharp. Uh, it, it really does create that illusion of like ver uh, double vertical resolution. And in, in, in a way that I'm with you, I, I would normally be totally against that kind of option, but for 3D games, it weirdly kind of works. So uh, it, it's it's interesting. I mean, this is like kind of catering to a different side of the uh, the audience that really wants to maintain sort of what they would think of as like a softer look, maybe a more CRT-like sort of blur to it, as opposed to the de-blur where we get really sharp pixels. Uh, it's it's just a different approach, and 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 people are you know on both ends of that spectrum. So I mean that's interesting, but again, it's it, that price is actually quite competitive, and that kind of brings me to one of my complaints with the Eon thing is that it's one hundred and fifty dollars. Um, it works well for what it does, but that's quite a bit to ask, I think, for what this offers. When you compare it to their previous product, which was the GCHD Mark II based on the GC Video project, that, uh, that offered both HDMI and analog output, as well as a whole menu with tons of different options to adjust, so you could kind of customize your experience on there, where this is a lot more simplistic. You just have digital video out, and it's literally just either line doubled sharp pixels or this slick filter. So in that sense, I, I, I think it works well, but it does, but the price is a little bit, it makes it tough to recommend, I think, in that sense. Um, whereas I guess the retro tank is also not super cheap and you'd still need to get cables and such for it, uh, extra, but it's multi-system compatible. And that's kind, kind of the key there, I think. Right, right. And you know, it's actually interesting, uh, retro access, which is a, uh, a nor uh, they normally sell SCART cables here in the U.S. Uh, they actually just uh, started selling an S video cable for twenty-five dollars for the uh, the SNES, N64, and GameCube, uh, which I think has sort of been a, a gap in the market for a while. There hasn't been like a good, high-quality new S video cable available for those systems for a long time, and a lot of people really want S video because that's what they have on their CRT TV or they wanted to get a lower price device like the RetroTink. And, uh, you know, so, but you can use that on, on multiple systems, you know? Uh, you can use that on three systems, or, or you could also connect a, a PlayStation or a Sega Saturn or, or, or so many different systems to a device like this. So it's, it's, it's a little difficult to justify unless you just literally have no interest in any retro system other than the N64, which I, I do think is the case for for some people who, who have a lot of strong nostalgia for it, but uh, I mean... Yeah, I mean, it, aesthetically speaking, I do think there is an element there. The, the way it fits into the system and the fact that it just uses a single HDMI cable is actually beneficial, and it also means you don't have to worry about the S-Video cable quality itself. I mean, if you have the retro access cable, uh, I'm sure it's great on the retro tank, but there's a lot of badass video cables out there that you can buy, uh, and that's like that becomes a real uh, minefield. If you if you're using a low quality cable with the retro tank, your quality is going to be worse versus the Eon, which is directly connected to the N64's AV port, so it's just pulling right off the board there through the port. I mean, right there, there's a lot of sort of uh, composite noise artifacts that you can get in some of the really cheap. S video cables. It's it, it can look kind of messy. Exactly. So that's something to watch out for. But yeah, I mean, overall, it's like um, we've talked about those four different products, and I feel like, from my perspective, the best of the best is still Ultra HDMI or N64 RGB, depending on what you want to do. But again, that requires you to either mod the system yourself or find someone to do it for you, and the cost on those tends to be even higher than the other solutions. So that's really very much like a high-end enthusiast product, whereas I feel like uh, the, the Super 64 from Eon is very much like, it's as plug and play and simple as you get. And if you're somebody that just really wants to play in 64 and you remember playing it, it is really just like a no fuss setup. 
You just plug it in, plug in an HDMI cable and you go. If you want to step up a little bit from that though, then the RetroTINK becomes a really good option as well, I think. Right, I mean, and the RetroTINK is for people who want to play more systems than just the N64, but still caters to that market that generally doesn't want to modify their consoles, which is, you know, a pretty huge market, I would imagine. And that's perfectly fair, absolutely. And yeah, like, like we've been saying, I mean, N64, this video output is actually pretty good. It's, it's one of those rare systems where due to the nature of what the GPU itself generates, uh, S-Video doesn't really look much different than uh, RGB overall, I feel. Whereas with like a PlayStation or some of the older systems as well, there is a more noticeable difference, I feel. Though S-Video still kind of holds its own, I think. But uh, in this case, it's not, it's not a bad way to go. Right, right. I mean, I, I think what a lot of people are looking for with an N64 video upgrade, like, just simply doesn't exist without resorting to emulation. I mean, people want higher resolution, they want better frame rates, they want uh, higher resolution textures. It, it's, it's just not going to happen on original hardware. You kind of have to accept the reality of what the N64 is first and then go from there to decide what kind of video output solution if you do indeed want to use the original hardware. Exactly. If you want to play Daikatana 64 in real hardware, it's, you know, it's a good option. I mean, that's that's what I'm saying. So, But um, I think that kind of touches all the bases. I think that, you know, since the Eon is what sparked this video, I do think it's, it's a well-made device but it's a little bit limited in what it offers for the price. So if you don't mind the price, it is a good solution, but um, it's not necessarily the premier way to do this. I guess that'll do it then for this one. So thanks for joining me, Mark. Yeah, it was good to be here again. And if you guys enjoyed this video, as always, be sure to like, subscribe, ring the notification bell at the top, and of course, follow us over on Twitter. And until next time, stay retro.